will be presented by uh, Svetlana uh, Kirdina Chandler, Doctor of Sociological Sciences, uh, Head of uh, Sector of Institutional and Evolution Economy of the Center of Institutional and Evolution Economy and Applied Problems of Reproduction of the Insti uh, Inst Institute of Economy of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Moscow. Uh, please, uh, Svetlana Georgievna, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm also partially a research fellow of the Rus Ural branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences, so it's a big honor for me. And great pleasure to be uh, presenting my keynote this symposium. I would like to share a material with you, which, well, on one hand, I've started working on it long ago, and it's become highly relevant recently, in recent months. This is the structure of my keynote. Uh, first, I'll be talking about globalization, and I'll show that this is not the same as internationalization. Then, sovereignty and sovereignization. Uh, what are the main trends and what is this? The central uh, part of my keynote will be about an increase in conflict situation, because sovereignization is in contradiction with globalization. One is on the rise, the other is on the decline. Then next, I'll talk about the solution of this conflict can be become an equally powerful bipolar polar coalitions. And uh, I will present theoretical reasons for that uh, statement. And in conclusion, I'll answer the main topic of our symposium, how economic theory helps overcome chaos. So globalization is not the same as internationalization. What's the difference? Internationalization is an eternal process which has been which has accompanied the development of humankind regularly. Internationalization means that the connection and interdependence between the states they grow stronger as mankind develops. And uh, this uh, process is we call internationalization. This is a natural process which accompanies the history of humankind. Unlike that, globalization is a relatively new process, it is a, rel it's a modern process, and it is a directed process. Its uh, essence is universalization of economic, political, ideological institutions, including those which uh, have a supranational nature. So globalization is a global process of unification of the rules that people live by uh, in different countries. That's uh, the difference between the directed process of globalization and the natural process of internationalization. Right from the start, I'll say that there are a lot of points of view on each of these notions, and I'm presenting the position which I share and which is in the a basis of this keynote. In, in order to understand the essence of globalization, um, well, the alternative to globalization is this public movement of alter globalism. And uh, in American and European, they, they reject the American European model of globalization, believing that it harms the development of human values, human rights, it harms the values of multiculturalism. They reject the global power of capital when the power of global corporation supersedes the power of states. So alter globalism, it shows, it's like kind of becomes a shadow of globalization as a modern process. One can say that the theory of globalization is not new. Uh, the theory of globalization, they become a continuation of the theory of modernization in the 50s and 60s. That's uh, Parsons, the American researchers, Huntington, Shields, and then um, quote our uh, researcher who is no longer with us, this historian Botaryov, who wrote that the theory of globalization and modernization, they uh, reflect uh, the uh, aspiration of the United States to submit in intellectual way the third world countries, which after post-colonial uh, uh, time uh, try to find their own path and the, the idea is well you do understand that the content of globalization theory is spreading modernization uh, is transborder spread of modernization and talking about globalization 
there's a single linear wave development from traditional states to modern states. We know states which believe to be modern, and the essence of modernization process was to pull in all other traditional underdeveloped, so to say, states into the modern state of being modernized. And uh, one should mention that the study in modernization, globalization, they found active support by from the budget of the United States and the Calhoun, the American, wrote about it, and uh, support by the um, social sciences uh, for the Post Foundation, by Carnegie Foundation, by Ford. And the idea is that if the states uh, will share these theories, if the states share these theories, they will welcome those who come to modernize those so there will be advisors uh, there will be investments from those countries and uh, these theories they like i've just quoted a colleague and they th their uh, intention was to submit an intellectual submission of other states and the modern theory of the globalization theory i'll say it again the essence here is the, the there is a universal way of development here the concepts are listed to which the globalization theory relate to one should mention note and as previous uh, as Mikhail Yurich, the previous speaker he first said about the process and only then open up the slide and i did the same and i only refer to uh, colleagues from japan who say and this is the the last quote on the slide uh, there are that some uh, countries use the language of globalization in pursuit of a highly nationalized agenda talk, next question about sovereignization because globalization well, there are different points of view there, and there is no, but there is no discussion about um, sovereignization. In modern discourse, it means that a standalone state has the right and power to determine its way of development. In other words, sovereignty is the right uh, of the state to develop the way it sees fit. And uh, today, uh, so there is a connection between uh, sovereignty and uh, nationhood. Uh, one cannot do without the other. And the trends of sovereignization, they, the researchers say that, scholars say that if everything's fine, you don't mention sovereignization, it's like breathing in air. But when crisis and shock, in the time of crisis and shock, this is when sovereignty comes into forefront and we can if I, I describe identify the degree of that sovereignty it becomes visible during crisis financial crisis during covid when logistical chains break and it, it becomes visible during section processes so during this period the role of sovereignization is strengthened and uh, the confirmation of that the different factors like trump who decided to localize manufacturing in the United States and bring the manufacturing companies back into the United States. So the United States is no longer dependent on manufacturing placed in other countries. So this is the island approach of sovereignization. And then there are talks about that in Russia and sovereignization as we understand. Well, we understand there are permanent crises, turbulences and instability. So there is a growing aspiration for sovereignization. So this aspiration for sovereignization it leads to an increase in conflict because sovereignization goes into conflict with globalization and uh, these processes they, they started back in 1993 when a global Vien, a conference on human rights was being prepared and initial countries they gathered the conference in bangkok where they said the human rights must be viewed in the international context, within regional context, because we're talking about sovereignty. But that declaration was not supported internationally, but rather it was a con declaration uh, which talked about the universal nature of human rights and freedoms, and it was finally ultimately supported. And we now know what this universal nature mean. So these processes, they are aimed at, directed in different ways because uh, civilization is uh, becoming stronger and globalization is declining 
because globalization is successful when it is ruled by one. Uh, uh, hegemon, but uh, when this hegemon becomes uh, weaker, this process slow down, and now there's the uh, crisis uh, of hege he he hegemony. There is chaos. So what we see is the contradiction of trends, and that leads to contradiction between the processes, globalization and the sovereignization. These are uh, pictures to demonstrate that the role of the Hegemon, hegemon is uh, weakened, so that's the share of the uh, United States. Uh, its share in uh, 20, 2000, uh, it used to be 30%, and China 3%, and now it's different. And uh, the trade balance, you say it's lower, it reached up to 700%. So they import a lot, but they produce very little on their territory. And there are additional factors which uh, strengthen these contradictions. And this is where I start talking about the role of science, which serves as evidence about of those facts. Uh, first, there is a evidence of uh, the increasing rising phase of the uh, a sixth well or quadrative cycle, which started in uh, 2020. And uh, during that period, uh, new states uh, come into the scene and come to the light, which uh, harness new technologies because it's a new technological wave. You don't need to catch up with anybody and you can be ahead of everyone. And uh, this is called Manbrick technology, medicine, uh, additive technologies A and nanotechnologies B, biotechnologies R, robotics I, information technology and K, cognitive technologies. So I was in the United States for it was six years ago and my cell phone broke and I went to the mobile shop and I wanted to buy a modern phone and they said, this is wrong address, you need to go to China. And I, I was so strange to hear that in the United States, because they said we don't we don't have such advanced phone here. You need to go to China. So I guess uh, China has been able to harness uh, certain technologies like 5G, which don't others don't have. Uh, another factor here is, well, there is a theory of. Uh, changing cycle of accumulation of capital. I'm glad you've repeated that. There is the 100 year cycle, American cycle of accumulated capital is now being replaced by the Asian cycle and those institutions which set the tone, which supported the American cycle of uh, accumulation of capital in America, they did not support uh, enough manufacturing capacities. And at the periphery of that, we now have a new center and many saw it. And uh, finally, there is one more table. Uh, there are uh, Y matrices and X matrix countries. So on the left, these are Western countries and on the right, non-Western countries. And uh, we see that total external debt of those Western countries is several times higher than their GDP. So it means they live on account of those countries who actually, in fact, pay for that debt. So we can say that there is a cumulative effect of all those factors. And so uh, counter standing between a globalization and civilization, it becomes uh, more t tougher. So sanctions, um, lack of certainty, problems of international settlements, uh, growing debt of Western countries, what you mentioned, etc. So what might serve a solution here? And this is my hypothesis. The solution might be, the answer might be in bipolarity. So what is bipolarity? First, let's say what's monopolarity. Monopolarity is a hegemony of one global player in the world and the uh, supporters uh, is the thesis of Fukuyama, that's the end of history, that liberal uh, institutions won, and unipolarity is, uh, again, as American authors say, is like an 
uh, Strauss, well well known in conspirological circles, but I didn't know that. His works were printed in 1998, and he said that unipolarity is like an endpoint of evolution. Unipolar world is inevitable. There is um, another extremity, that's multipolarity. There are a lot of supporters here, and they're talking about multipolar um, world as well. But those who are against it say well, it means uh, chaos, like Kissinger, who wrote about it. Uh, Others believe that multipolarity is transition from uh, monopolar to bipolar world. And probably can agree with that. What's bipolarity? Well, first of all, it is a division of the sphere of influence and there are poles of economic and political life uh, in the form of two groups of states. And uh, those states can form military alliances and when they have frontiers uh, identified and they have the rules of the dialogue. So both sides admit that. So bipolarity can be interpreted differently as well. So some say that bipolarity existed only uh, during USSR and United States and nothing similar happened before, nothing similar will happen after. Uh, that was in 2009. Uh, another point of view of Yakovlev, uh, he said there are two poles, the West, which is quite clear, and another non-Western, it's not a monolith. Uh, and he wrote about it in year 2000, so was changed since then. Uh, first of all, here, I endorse the point of view which Tikhomirov expressed in 1997, saying that at a global level, a global public system has always been bipolar because monopolarity is against the laws of nature. The world is doomed to be bipolar because because the poles, they complete each other as the unity of uh, of oppositions, like men and women in Indian night and day. So uh, how bipolarity is implemented in the global world? Well, I'm working with institutional things and they see that bipolarity is being institutionalized in the form of creation of uh, powerful uh, symmetric coalitions. And we have examples from history that uh, once those uh, equally uh, strong coalitions are established, well then, for example, in Europe, there was a relatively calm and peaceful. When there was anti-Hitler coalition, you know, Hitler attacked a lot of countries and then their anti-Hitler coalition, those countries went peace. Or during Cold War, there was a relatively peaceful time. What do we have in the first century? We have Western coalition, the basis, uh, that's uh, United States, European Union, NATO, and G G7. And uh, uh, currently, this coalition is growing, becoming stronger. In 2014, the example was the global coalition to call the Islamic State in Syria and then 2022 anti-Russian coalition uh, Rammstein 1, 2 and 3 now it includes 47 countries in May 2022 the application of Sweden and Finland to enter NATO and so this Western coalition is clearly presenting itself and using the United States um, European Union G7 as founding pillars another uh, coalition, non-Western, that's uh, uh, operation, SEO, BRICS, uh, CIS countries, and it's now demonstrating more and more. In 2001, SEO included five members, then 2022, nine members, three observers, eight filed applications, nine partners. 2020, there's SEO Plus, including BRICS and SAS. CIS countries having parliamentary meetings, regular events, and yesterday, yesterday Argentina and Iran filed applications to become members, and Saudi Arabia is expected. And Develt wrote that there is uh, the world is breaking down into the world of Western values and BRICS countries. 
and uh, it's been mentioned the economic theory does not include values fails to include values which are a very significant element of not just economic development of the establishment of the institution and what we see today is that the world is breaking into those coalitions and the basis of that division is um, values and some say these are uh, western values and non-western values in conclusion we can say that this uh, establishment of equally powerful and hope equally powerful because only if the coalition is equally powerful then we can avoid the catastrophe then this leads us to the establishment of bipolar post neocolonial world the second thing we can see is that despite the fact that these alliances are different we have a all there BRICS, NATO, G7 uh, but one coalition um, joins X countries and uh, x matrix countries and other coalition joins together y matrix countries and this is visible and uh, in my book on pages 315 317 i kind of predicted this process that the establishment of these coalitions will uh, be only stronger and it is written in the book that all coalitions they now be uh, gain institutional framework and this process is very important and uh, we have the synthesis uh, in economic theory and the, the value of synthesis and the focus that was made 70 years ago is now become more precise so i think theoretical synthesis increases enhances the capacity of economic theory to foresee chaos and in conclusion i would like to make another forecast hope hope that bipolarity is not just about concentration well we're talking about technological potential of each of these groups but institutionally they have been consolidated in form of different coalitions and i think that ultimately they will become the milestones of new world order and Chris wrote about it in 1997 and this world order is being established as we speak and i do believe do believe that bipolar coalitions will help suppress uh, contradictions of uh, and they will save a world from the catastrophe thank you yes and here is the literature which was used and there is other thank you